Welcome back to the Original Gangsters podcast. I'm here in studio with my colleague and co-conspirator, Scott Bernstein. Hey now. And Ben behind the glass. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato, a.k.a. The Doctor. Thank you for joining us. Just want to remind you to follow us on social media. Please subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. And uh, we read all of your comments and uh you know, we, we appreciate that. It's just uh, it's not always uh, easy for us to respond and reply to every single one. I'm going to get better at it, I promise. <laughs> but we do we do read them and we and we appreciate that uh, every one of them. I just got to get used to it because it's it's not something that we've really been we haven't been in that like engagement mode, no. and that's on us. Yeah. For the last couple of years, so I just I need to. Yeah. It needs to become a routine for me to go through those and, and respond because uh, you're. You, you're valuable to us. Your your, your insight and uh, perspective to what you know, what we're doing and what we're uh, providing you is important for us to make the show the best it can be. So yeah, we appreciate that. So speaking of social media, before we get to our big topic, we actually have a big uh, Outlaw Motorcycle Club episode planned today. But before we get to that, we just want to spend a few minutes here talking about social media. And uh, we published a poll on YouTube. If you if you subscribe to our video channel or check out our video channel, I posted a poll over the weekend, and I wanted to go over the results and then just kick it to uh, my colleagues here, Scott and Ben, and see how they would do these rankings. I think it's a fun conversation. We won't spend a lot of time on it. But if you look at the poll I published on YouTube, I asked, uh, which old school gangster TV show are you binging over the weekend? And we had five choices. Boardwalk Empire, Breaking Bad, Sons of Anarchy, The Sopranos, and The Wire. So I think that's probably the big five of, like, OG gangster TV shows. And here are the results, and then I'm curious to see what my friends and colleagues here think. I'm not shocked by the results. Yeah. Uh, number one is Sopranos, 63%. You could keep voting, by the way, audience members. But Sopranos, number one. Uh, the Wire comes in at number two with 15%. Boardwalk Empire, number three, at 13%. And then Sons and Breaking Bad both have 5% at the bottom there. So, uh, gentlemen, if you were going to binge, uh, which one of these would you revisit? Which order would you uh, would you rank those? And, by the way, I think we can say that we're fans of all of these shows. So it's yeah, not like we're going to shit talk full, full, any of them. Full transparency here for those five shows. I've completed four of them. Uh Breaking Bad, I never finished. Oh wow! And wow! I, I know that that is a <laughs> I just blemish <laughs> on my record. Uh, I watched the first, I think, three seasons, and I loved it. And I need so maybe my answer to this to the uh, to the poll question is I would need to binge the rest of of Breaking Bad. I, I know what happened at the end because I I watched the final uh, couple episodes, the finale, yeah. but I. I, I missed a whole like two three seasons. So wh which which ones would you just rank though in terms of so of, of your favorites? I mean, I think Sopr the 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 show that won to me is the show that should have won, which is The Sopranos. I think it's the the easiest to binge, the most fun, uh, the the thing that I think combines both drama and great writing, great acting, but also a lot of humor. There's there's the I think we talked about it when we were talking about the film, how I, I didn't, or the prequel film, how I didn't love the story that was being told to me in many saints of Newark, but I loved being back in that world. Mm -hmm. It felt very familiar. It felt very comfortable. Yeah, I agree. I, th I think, uh, Sopranos has the most rewatchability yes. out of all of those. That's a good way to put it. Uh, like, as Scott said, the humor in it, uh, all those shows, yeah, you have some funny moments, but it's not like The Sopranos where they're breaking balls and, you know, it's like Goodfellas in yeah. terms of the Or The lines. Godfather and The Godfather. The amount, of, the amount of lines you can repeat. Yeah. And you never get sick of watching it, like you and said. And you can never get sick of watching it. A lot of those other shows, not so much. I will say The Sopranos, out of all of those five, has the highest peak of television. But I don't think... It's the greatest show from front to back out of those five. Ah, interesting. Tell us more. Share. <laughs> I would, I would actually say, out of those five, I have not watched Sons of Anarchy. Shame on me. I got to watch that. It's good. But I have seen the other four. Uh, I would say Breaking Bad is the best from front to back. 
in all seasons. I think Sopranos season six, not just because of the final episode. I'm fine with how it ended. Fine with David Chase's decision. I actually like the artistic choice to do it that way. But I think the Soprano feel dies off in season six, part one and two. I, I'll go. But, I'll make know. even a, a bolder claim. And I, I love the Sopranos. So some of this is blasphemous. But <laughs> to me, the first three seasons were in a league of its own with the Sopranos. Totally agree. The first three seasons were, per, I mean, perfect. The way that the two Godfathers are perfect. And, I don't, yeah. and the way that Goodfellas is perfect. Perfect. There's yep. nothing that would change. Going from season four, five, and six, I know there was two seasons, two two parts of season six. Um, I actually thought it revved up, it ticked up, ticked back up at the end. I enjoyed the way it ended with kind of the the chaos surrounding the war and all that stuff. But I I, I didn't particularly, in retrospect, I thought it it dipped. In like five, like four I didn't like or five, five it either. dipped. I didn't like five. No, but I agree. The first, to me, the first two seasons of The Sopranos is peak television. Best I've ever seen. How but, would you guys, so how would you but rank? Three, but three, but season three, you get Ralphie, that first, that, the, season that, that three first year too. of Ralphie. The, day, the Richie Aprile Ralphie back-to-back seasons as yeah. the uh, antagonists were so, so great. I mean, two of the greatest uh, villains uh, for a show full of anti heroes, they weren't hero. They weren't heroes at all. They no. were they were the villains, and and they yeah. were just so amazing. David Provals, Richie Aprile, and, and uh, Joe Pantliano as Ralphie Cifaretto. So how would you how would you rank the? We'll take Breaking Bad out for Scott. We'll take Sons out for Ben. How where would you put your three and four then? Well, I I go Sopranos. Me? Yeah. I go Sopranos. Or two, three, and four. I go Sopranos, Wire, Sons, Boardwalk. Okay. I will go Breaking Bad, then Sopranos, then Boardwalk, and then The Wire. The Wire, man, season four, I, I, it, it, I had a trouble getting through it. It I, took me a long time because I don't like when shows focus around children. Yeah. And that was the whole season when it's the elementary, the, the elementary the, school the Baltimore kids. public schools. That's yeah. when the, that was the focus. And I think it died a lot. I didn't particularly love the opinion. whole, like uh, the Greek on the boats and the, yeah, the Al Sabaka, or, or yeah. uh, his name wasn't Al Sabaka. Sabaka. Al Sabaka was a, a guy that r- ran the, uh, drove the Zamboni of the Detroit Red Wings. Yeah. So I'm confusing <laughs> him with the, the gangster character <laughs> on, on, um, on, on the wire. Yeah. But uh, there were parts of season two that I liked, but I, I didn't love all the corruption on the docks. Yeah. A lot of people are critical of season two as well. Yeah. Um, I didn't mind it, but, um, Definitely not elite television all the way through for me. Yeah, I would I would agree with you guys. I mean, for my number one is The Sopranos, and uh, I I would agree with one thing and push back on another. I I would agree with that. I think Breaking Bad, and I would put Sons in there are more even than Sopranos because I agree with Ben that season six for The Sopranos wasn't as strong. What I would push back on is, I still love seasons four and five. I for me, Sopranos is no again is I, one through five, and then the dip is in six. I'm not, not saying not I didn't love it. I loved it. I'm just saying in the in the context of comparing things that I loved. Yeah, I thought the first three seasons were superior to the last three seasons, but I loved it all. Yeah, I, see, I, I think I go. I still put four and five. I think um, four and five are. I'm, I'm going to have a little bit of spoilers. Almost gotta, as good as, as two and so You can put out spoilers. If you haven't seen The Sopranos at this point, that's on you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what season was Chris involved in the movie shit? That, that was season, that was the first part of season six. Yeah. Oh, that was season six? Okay. The first Didn't part, like that not at the all. second part. No, okay, I, okay, I agree. Okay, okay. And then the part where Adriana Cleaver. takes the uh, bullet? That's five. That's five. Okay. But I like that. So there was I, I like still, that storyline. Yeah. There's yeah. still great story arcs in five and four. So it's still good television. I thought they copped out on some storylines and they did not cop out on the Adriana LaServa storyline. I I just they showed that showed you how brutal and and 
and cold blooded these guys are. Season six just didn't have the same Soprano feel. To I me. agree. That's that. I agree. And and I see the reason why I stick up for season five is the introduced. I felt like it was a nice jolt because they introduced some really interesting characters with Frank Vincent's character Phil Leotardo. I thought they introduced him in four. No, he gets out of jail. They all, all those guys get out of jail. It's called the, the class of two thousand four. Okay. Yeah, they all okay, get out of right. jail in season five. Right. Okay, Steve right. Buscemi's yeah, character. that was all that started five. You're um, right. Okay, you're right. Angelo, you start seeing guys like Rusty. Yeah, um, and so you get more New York stuff. Which, by the way, I've talked to other people. They don't. They didn't like that as much. I mean, again, like like you're saying, they still love the show overall, but but they felt like the New York stuff was distracting from the Jersey stuff. But as a nerd who loves this stuff, for me. The mafia politics, those are some of my favorite It would have been lines. more <laughs> realistic if they would have had the war between, let's say, New Jersey and Philadelphia mm-hmm. than mm-hmm. New Jersey and, and New York. Cause in, well, that would never uh, happen. It, right. yeah. I mean, again, we're, we're playing the whole, like, if this was a real crime family and this was, yeah. uh, you know, a real life, uh, it's ridiculous to think that the New Jersey crime family could go to war with no. one of the five families and not just survive, but win win the war (laughs) right where did where did you put sons of anarchy again i put sons number three okay yeah i would put sopranos one i would put sons number two and wow okay i i do think i do understand why people prefer breaking bad or the wire i wouldn't necessarily argue with you that sons of anarchy is a is a better show I just like it. I liked it more. I've I've found Sons more entertaining than I did those those other shows. It's real over the top. It's, it's a lot of times it's unrealistic. Yeah, but it, I, it's I'm very not, sort of comic bookish. Uh, uh, but I, and I say that in a good way. I, I'm a comic book nerd, so I I don't I mean that in a good way. A lot of action. I loved how Sons had the different crime groups. Almost every episode there was like a a crime group of the week who they were fucking with. Either black gangs, Italian mafia, uh, Russian mafia, the Mayans, the Mayans, triads, cartels, uh I even Irish organized crime. I I always I always thought that was fun. I you know, this is I think we're gonna be able to segue. It's gonna be a nice, smooth, clean segue, uh, because we're talking about Sons of Anarchy and then we're about to jump in to the story of the Outlaws Motorcycle Club in two thousand twenty two and the fact that this uh, the, the the most prominent Outlaw Motorcycle Club in the Midwest is the Outlaws, and uh, they have a a member of the Outlaws right now who's in his late twenties, uh, JoJo Noe, who a lot of people call the real life Jax Teller, because um, there's some similarities between his background and and the fictional character Jax Teller played by Charlie uh, Charlie Hunnam Hunnam um, in uh, in Sons, and we're going to talk about that in a second, but you know. I fell in love with Sons because it was at the same time that I was falling in love with researching real life uh, biker activity. Yeah. It was something that I knew nothing about uh, as much as I didn't know about the mafia before I started reporting on it and researching it. I knew it a little bit from you know my family, from the movies I had watched, the television shows I had watched, my grandpa's friends. So I didn't know it like an expert, but I knew it. I didn't know one iota about outlaw biker culture until I started studying it and researching it. And then all of a sudden the show is on the air and it's bringing to life, at least in a, in a fictional galaxy uh, stuff that I, I was studying. And, and, in, and in a lot of ways it, it helped me, <laughs> helped me understand the culture, even though it was a Hollywood version of that culture. So, yeah, I, uh, I, I think it's fun. And I, I would put, Probably, I don't know, I, I guess I would probably put The Wire at, at five. I mean, it, The Wire, Boardwalk, four or five. Breaking Bad, I would put three. And I, I would just shout out what I, I actually did binge Better Call Saul over the weekend. Oh, you and, did. And Ben, if you're a big Breaking Bad guy, you should probably watch it. The first few seasons are, are kind of tough because it's not very gay. It's not really, it's not as related to the to the Breaking Bad universe. But eventually, you get like the Chicken Man and you know Salamanca. And spoiler, I think everyone like Scott's saying everyone knows this already. Walter White shows up in Better Call Saul in the last season, the last few episodes in flashbacks, and so does Jesse. So does Hank. And it's it's fun. It's fun to revisit that sort of like you were saying with. Uh, many saints. Like if you were a Breaking Bad person, it was really fun and satisfying to see 
Walter White turn up again, even though we we obviously know he's not around. But yeah, like in yeah. these in these flashbacks, and uh, it, I'd be, I'd be curious to hear Ben what you think about how it turns out for Saul, aka Jimmy, um, at the very end. Um, I have mixed feelings on how on how it how it ended, but uh, anyhow, we we appreciate everyone participating in the poll, and we we have fun talking about these shows. But yeah, I mean, we were talking about Sons of Anarchy. Bernie has been doing some reporting about the outlaws. Uh, on the East Coast, and I think that's going to be the the rest of our episode here. So, um, tell us tell us what's going on. So, let's first just give people a primer on the Outlaws Motorcycle Club, uh, which, outside of the Hell's Angels, is the biggest name on the marquee when it comes to biker world OC around the world. Um, they're international. Uh, they were started in Chicago. Uh, eventually the, the the seat of power moved to Detroit uh, in, in the 1980s and stayed there until the 2000s. Um, right now, the seat of power in the Outlaws is on the East Coast uh, for really the first time uh, in Outlaws Motorcycle Club history. Uh, the president, international president um, of the club has been identified in, in court papers over the last couple of years. Uh, as a as a guy named uh, John Ermine out in Buffalo goes by the nickname Tommy O, and he is uh, reportedly a very charismatic leader. He's tied into the mafia in Buffalo, uh, runs security at uh, Pharaoh Strip Club, which is a strip club run by the Tadaro crime family. And over the last couple of years, as as Tommy O has taken power, the outlaws have found themselves fighting wars on two separate fronts. So you have the longstanding dispute that the outlaws have had with the Hells Angels, which is a war that's been going on on and off since 1973. Uh, the longest standing biker feud probably ever. Um, and, uh, you have another war that's taking place uh, between the outlaws and the pagans and the pagans and outlaws had never been adversarial before outlaws and hell's angels have been adversarial for 50 years. Um, pagans were a, a, a regional group that were based out of the Southeast Southeastern part of the United States and under new leadership, in their club uh, from about five, six years ago, a guy by the name of Conan the Bar, or Keith Richter, who goes by the nickname Conan the Barbarian, they've undertook an expansion campaign where they are actively moving out of the Southeast in up the, 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 the Eastern seaboard into New England and then fanning out to the, the West, the Pacific Northwest, uh, into parts of the South they haven't been in in, in the past, uh, going into areas like Texas and Oklahoma and uh, Oregon and Washington. It's a very ambitious, very ambitious plan. Um, and this has put them at odds with the outlaws. So you've had a series of shootings and, and killings that have resulted um, from this well, really from both, but from the dust up with the pagans, there is uh, some some pending murder cases. And then the longstanding feud between the Hells Angels and the outlaws resulted in a big first degree murder trial uh, that just ended in New England and at Fall River, Massachusetts, where the quote unquote real Jax Teller uh, Jojo Noe Jr., uh, 28 years old. It's kind of a every man, you know, in terms of the way he looks. There, there's some resemblance to Jack's Teller. Now, he's, you know, he, he's a guy that uh, is uh, has blonde hair, and uh, his dad was one of the uh, not one of the founders of the Outlaws in general, but helped or was very integral in bringing the Outlaws to New England. 
about 30 years ago. His dad's the, is a, a luminary in the outlaws um, organization known as Joe Dogs. Uh, Joe Senior, Joe Noe Senior, Joe Dog. That was the storyline in Sons. Was right. Jax Teller's father was a shot call or right. like a influential dude. Back yes, in the and day. then Jax Teller was being groomed as a leader in in the Sam Crow. And over the last five, six, seven years, little JoJo has been groomed as a future leader uh, in, in the New England Outlaws. He was tasked. Uh, he's, he's from Taunton, um, where I believe his dad led the Taunton uh, uh, Outlaws. But JoJo in the last couple of years has been tasked with helping start up the Fall River chapter of, of the Outlaws. And Fall River is a working class factory town smack dab in between Boston and Providence. And it's, uh, it's very hard scrabble, very gritty, a lot of uh, different ethnicities. It's, it's a real melting pot. And uh, there... Uh, in addition to this expansion going on by the pagans, Tommy O has a mini expansion of his own going on where the outlaws are in, in a new England expansion as the pagans are in this nationwide expansion. And part of this expansion is going into parts of well, the purpose of this expansion is going into parts of the Northeast that they hadn't been in, in hadn't been in before. And the fact that they finally have, a president that exists in that region is only strengthening the outlaws power on the East coast. So Tommy O is, is putting, I think they've put something like 10 chapters in different uh, cities uh, in new England over the last two, three years. And one of those new chapters was the fall river, fall river chapter. Meanwhile, fall river had always been a, a, a hell's angels stronghold. So, uh, it gets confusing even for me who reports on it, but you have the, the big name brand clubs, the, the three that we've thrown out today, Hells Angels, Pagans, Outlaws. But then underneath those clubs, you have what they call support clubs or puppet clubs where they're smaller clubs that aren't absorbed by the bigger clubs. They, they don't quote unquote patch over, but they exist. To, to augment the, the big club. So it's almost like uh, if here in Detroit, uh, you got the Detroit Tigers. And then if you, if you go an hour down yeah. south into Ohio, you have the Toledo Mud Ends. Right. So they're not the Toledo Tigers, they're the Toledo Mud Ends, but they support the yeah. Detroit Tigers. Yeah. So in Fall River, you have a group called the Sidewinders, which is the main Hells Angels support club in Fall River. Uh, in the, in September of 2019, I believe, uh, that's the date I can double check. Um, there was an altercation at a popular biker bar or biker hangout, um, in fall river. It took place. Yeah. September of night uh, of 2019. And this is one of the four or five murder cases that, have been filed against members of the outlaws in, in recent years tied to all of this drama and just something like out of a movie script. Uh, 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 first it, it, it was, it's very intriguing and compelling to follow this, even though it takes place in a small city like fall river, but there's been a lot of, you know, Jojo, no, no, he, ha you know, clearly has a lot of flair and a lot of swagger. And he was, and this is the reason I'm comparing it to a movie script is first you had a couple of years ago, he's arrested for first degree murder in a very questionable parking lot brawl shooting that spoiler alert, he was acquitted of last week. So now he's on the other side of it. He's a free man. Doesn't have to worry about this anymore, but we're going to kind of do a quick little deep dive into that, uh, into that shooting which was a brawl in, in the parking lot of JC's cafe uh, between Jojo Noe and his entourage, uh, which included his girlfriend and his uncle and a large group of, of sidewinders and black hand motorcycle club members. And the black hand were a support club for the sidewinders, which were a support club for the hell's angels. And, uh, 
there was like 20 of them against like three outlaws. And uh, as the, the, the sidewinders were assaulting JoJo's uncle. I think they had lead pipes, right? They had, they have, they were, well, they had jo- weapons, right? Yeah, JoJo, um, JoJo's uncle was being beaten uh, with, with, with pipes and, and bats and, and uh, two by fours. And uh, uh, JoJo no uh, shot one of the people that was looking like he was about to kill his uncle. Uh, Eric Fochelle was his name. He was a fireman. He was also a member of the Sidewinders. So let me, I know I'm all over the place. I apologize. But why this is kind of very, uh, it has a lot of entertainment um, value to it. And, 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 and it's, it's easy to paint a picture when, when there are these events that are just kind of organically feeling very like made for a reality show or made for a scripted show. So uh, little Jojo uh, gets arrested after the, 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 the shooting in 2019. He's kept for, I want to say six months to a year. Uh, they, they're denying him bond. The judge uh, decides to grant him bond. I think this was the last, uh, about a year and a half ago during the, pu- the peak of the pandemic. And you had about a thousand supporters of the outlaws coming to the, to the, to the police station and they, they prop up Jojo no, no, he's bike. And he literally walked out of the police station. They un, they, they take off the handcuffs. He puts on his, his, uh, his outlaws gear jumps on his chopper and, and kind of leads a, a, uh, a cavalcade of outlaws from the police station to a kind of a welcome home party. So it's very dramatic. Yeah, it's very dramatic. <laughs> uh, but uh, he still had to um, account for, for the case. Uh, and it went to trial um, in August. And it was about a, a, a three-week trial. And, you know, I looked at all the facts. I got my hands on some police reports. Um, I got my hands on some eyewitness testimony. And I wrote some stories before the trial. And it was pretty clear that this was self-defense. So I wasn't shocked that he was acquitted and was found not guilty. Um, I can break down some of the facts right now. Uh, but, you know, this, this wasn't anywhere near. I mean, we want, this was the definition of an overcharge by a prosecutor. If you're going to charge this guy, you, you, you charge him with second degree. But to say that this was a, a premeditated murder, if you look at the facts, the eyewitness testimony and the surveillance footage that came from the bar, none of it speaks to a, a premeditated murder. In fact, it speaks to a, a, a group of rivals to the outlaws trying to bully and intimidate Jojo, his girlfriend and his uncle. And that intimidation turned physical and it could have become fatal if if Jojo didn't intercede and, and protect his uncle and possibly his girlfriend from being hurt. So, so no charges were filed against the other guys. No. For assault. So what you had was Jojo, his girlfriend, his uncle, and I think one or two other people uh, went into this JC's Cafe on September 13, 2019 to get a drink. They went and took a table at the back of a tavern. They weren't looking for any trouble. At the bar, when they went and sat down, were a group of Black Hand Motorcycle Club members who were connected to the Sidewinders, who are connected to the Hells Angels. And these Black Hand members were looking to start trouble. And they were leaving the bar, going to the parking lot where they would congregate. They were on their cell phone. They were calling for backups, for reinforcements. Um, After about 45 minutes... Jojo and his entourage are about after about an hour, uh, they decide to leave. The reinforcements hadn't shown up yet. So it looked like based on the surveillance video, these black hand motorcycle club members created an altercation with Jojo to, to have, to give the sidewinders members that were coming to the bar to presume, presumably beat up 
Jojo and his entourage had, you know, they weren't going to be there for another two, two, three minutes. So the black club or black hand motorcycle club members created a diversion, which was to stop Jojo and his entourage as they were going uh, to the parking lot to get on their uh, bikes to leave. And there was a, a verbal spat. People had to get in between Jojo and this member, uh, this member of the black hand club. It lasted two or three minutes. By the time the, that altercation breaks up and Jojo, his uncle, his, uh, his fiance are in the parking lot going to their vehicles to leave. All of a sudden a dozen sidewinders show up and they're wielding weapons, uh, bats, lead pipes, two by fours. And immediately this is all shown on tape corner Jojo and his fiance by a chain link fence. And one of the members of the Sidewinders, not Voschel, who gets killed, takes out what almost looked like nunchucks, um, some type of ha- uh, some type of hammer attached to like a chain, and swings it at Stephanie. Uh, I, I don't know her last name, but that's Jojo's fiance. And Jojo then pulls out his weapon. He has a registered. A firearm license with a, or has a registered firearm with a with a, a legal license um, to carry. He pulls it out, uh, and that crowd then disperses away from him and his fiance and turn their attention to his uncle, who was about to get on his bike at the same time as as Jojo and, and his fiance were, and that come that becomes a melee, and. Uh, Jojo's uncle and and I think one or two other people are attacked by these 12, 13 sidewinders. They're being attacked with weapons. Uh, Jojo's uncle, Johnny Noe, uh, has his his skull cracked by a hammer. And as Eric Fischel is, uh, you know, grabbing a pipe and running full speed, uh, taking a swing at Johnny Johnny Noe, Jojo shot him dead is his uncle patched his Uh uncle i'm not sure but his uncle uh had to be admitted to the hospital had to spend i think a week in the hospital uh with very serious injuries and from all that we get a first degree murder charge that jojo beat last week after a three-week trial but it was a three-year ordeal and uh it, it is kind of emblematic of what's going on with the outlaws right now you know how many shots he fired uh, I don't. I, th- I I have it in a report somewhere. Oh. Um, it, it it wasn't. A, he didn't rip off a bunch of shots. Okay. Yeah, because that that becomes problematic if you've yeah, ever had uh, training for like carrying a right. You're you're told right away. Self defense is you know, is once the threat is neutralized, you yeah. don't keep on. If you keep on pulling the trigger, which was part you're of the, get in trouble. Right, which was part of the issue that he had because the threat against him had been neutralized. So this was, he was pleading self-defense in defense of a third party. And that's part of a, a, of the self-defense act. Um, and if you can prove that a third party is uh, it, it, it about to uh, face irreparable danger or harm, you have a right, uh, you have a duty to, to defend. Do you know where he shot him? Uh, where Rochelle was killed, or what part of the body what Rochelle was killed? Body. I don't, I'm, I, I, okay. I don't know off the top of my head. But the, when the police arrived, Rochelle was dead on the ground. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I guess it depends. I don't know the laws in Massachusetts, but I know when I had my training in Michigan, if you're defending a family member, it's different. But like, if if a third party is under um, assault. They instruct you to call the police, stay out of it. Like you, you. Well, that's where make, there were things worse. Well, that's <laughs> where there was some wiggle room, I think, for authorities. Yeah, right. They tried to explain. Yeah, because you know the danger had been removed from him and his fiance at that point. Right, right. But I think with this, because it was his family member, I think, I, I, I think it sounds like it was justified to me. But that he. Well, you know, that's what his, that's what they uh, that's the, what the jury, the jury found, yeah. and uh, I, 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 I didn't understand the first degree charging. Um, and there's another couple incidents like this that I can go over right yeah, now. Yeah, I mean, he didn't. It seems like he didn't go out looking to kill someone. Right, and night. there are, there are at least 
three other incidents right now involving outlaws around the country. Two are in Tennessee, one out of Nashville, one out of Clarksville, and then another case out of Oklahoma where I don't want to say the circumstances are identical, but similar circumstances where if there is culpability, it would be manslaughter culpability. But the, but beca- I'm guessing because they're outlaws and they wear their colors and they're proud to wear their colors, they're looked at as, you know, a menace that these individuals are looked at as menaces to society and are not given the benefit of the doubt. So the prosecutors are coming in with the first degree murder uh, charges, whether or not they're warranted or not. Let me, by the way, uh, just a fact from their actual site here that Outlaws website, they were the first one percenter club east of the Mississippi. So they're definitely the OGs here. Um, Let me ask you something. Do you think that this was, does this restaurant have a reputation for being a hangout for them? Yeah. Other, I mean, was it, was it a, I, I'm not saying, don't get it twisted. I'm not saying that, that it justified anybody getting jumped, but was it a provocation for him to go to this? There had been a number of incidents at JC's Tavern in the previous year um, that had led to a no color rule. Uh, because there had been a lot of fights between biker factions. Yeah. So Jojo and his crew were not wearing any identifying gear, identifying them as, as outlaws in the black hand motorcycle club. Weren't wearing any identifying gear either, but because Jojo Noe and the outlaws are pretty high profile, um, then the sidewinders and no disrespect to people that ride and support clubs, but, like we were saying, there's you know, there's the Toledo Mud Hens and there's the Detroit Tigers. There's the Columbus Clippers or the Columbus Yankees and the New York Yankees. So by by assaulting there's the Durham them, Bulls and there's the Atlanta Braves. But by assaulting them, they're trying to curry favor with the Hell's Angels. I'm assuming. Yeah, Is they're just the- they're at uh, the war between the Hell's Angels and the Outlaws. I don't believe this has been changed. I mean, there are varying degrees of follow through, but the the rules of that war state when you see a member of your rival club, you attack on site. Yeah. And if you don't, you're going to have your colors pulled. Well, I wanted to ask you about the politics of it because my understanding, it was always that new England, maybe it was just Boston. I'm, I'm misinformed, but I always thought new England was hell's angels stronghold. Well, it and wa- it seems like you're saying the pagans and now the outlaws are. Yeah. Well, the hell's angels, came, hell's angels came in there in the seventies. Yeah, and then Joe Dogs, uh, little Jojo Noe's dad, was one of the founding fathers of the New England uh, outlaws who came in there in like the mid eighties. And the Hell's Angels. Um, so there, there's been you know simmering tensions between those, okay. between at least between the outlaws and the Hell's Angels in New England for thirty years plus. Um, you know, the, the pagans are, you know, you're, you're adding more, you know, new fuel to the fire and uh, more fuel Because the pagans and the, the Hells Angels don't like each other either. You've got a three. Yeah. Because, I mean, there's. And, there's, the, and then, to, you know, there's some more politics in this. The pagans have aligned with the Mongols. Oh, yeah. Which is another 1% group. I was wondering about that. Uh, and the Mongols are helping them in their push West. They're more West, right? Mongols. Mongols are more West. And then I think we talked about this on, on another show, but I'll just re- reiterate or mention it again. The pagans, part of the pagans expansion effort is saying, screw this white nationalism stuff. Like if you can help us expand our brand and, and boost our bottom line, we don't care if you're, if you're <laughs> white. Yeah, and they've opened the the ranks to Hispanics, and they've focused on recruiting a lot of Latino members, especially as a weapon for their arsenal as they head west because they're such a Hispanic influence. Isn't that part of west? The, uh, people can correct me if I'm wrong, but the isn't part of the history of the Mongols because the Hell's Angels wouldn't allow Latino members into the club. So the they, banditos and the Mongols. Yeah, yeah. So they started. Yeah. So there was more like. Um, Multi-ethnic. Yeah. You didn't have to be just a white dude right. to, to get into it. So that's a strategic partnership. Um, so, so you have 
these situations that are popping up all around the country. And it's not just in New England where you have this trial take place. You have another three trials, another three murder trials um, that will go off in the next year. Uh, like I said, two in Tennessee and one in, well, actually, I don't know what's going on in Oklahoma right now. I got to double check. Uh, but the the main defendant in the Oklahoma case, let's let's go to there for go there for a second. Um, Arlo Nelson, just like Jojo Noe, he was a, a a head for the wall. You know, if if you're a member of law enforcement, if you're a prosecutor, if you're a cop, you want these big name, high ranking guys. And th these are the type of big fish, if you will, that are going to get you promotions. And sometimes, a lot of the times, there's overcharging. So it, it, it was a lot sexier to go after Jojo Noe for killing Eric Vachel, um, than it probably would have been for Eric Vachel killing Jojo Noe because nobody knows who the sidewinders are. Everybody knows who the outlaws are. So in... Uh, Oklahoma, in, uh, out of Oklahoma City, you had the pagans show up out of nowhere two, three years ago, um, open up a chapter. You had the outlaws who had been against the ropes uh, from a, a, a bus that had happened in the 2000s that had put some um, major shot callers away in prison. Uh, one of those being this... Uh, uh, Virgil Nelson, who everyone calls Arlo. And Arlo was, you know, we were talking about, uh, you know, it, with the New England guys, we're talking about people that were, were, were founding fathers. Arlo Nelson was a, a founding father of the outlaws in Oklahoma. Um, he was one of the seven guys that started the first outlaw chapter in Oklahoma. I think it was in 76 or 77. Um, there was DEA and ATF surveillance of Arlo and those guys in 77 going to Florida and being officially patched in um, to, you know, part of the outlaw regime. And then they ran roughshod through Oklahoma city uh, in the seventies, eighties, nineties. Finally, a, a bunch of these guys went away. Arlo Nelson comes out of prison. There's some debate about what role he has right now in, in in the club, the government is making it to seem like he's the godfather. Um, I have a lot of people telling me, uh, sources, if you will, people in that Oklahoma outlaw orbit that he's not the godfather. That, yes, he's a very respected member of, of that club, but he's more of like a um, emeritus. He's more of a guy that, you know, has standing in the club because of him being an OG, but isn't the shot caller like the government is making it out to be. Anyway, uh, in 2020, um, or sorry, in, no, let me, let me double check the, the date on this. Uh, I believe it was 2020. In um, 2020, there was a shooting on, a high, on an expressway, on a highway in Oklahoma, where there was gunfire exchange between two pagans and two outlaws. And one of the pagans who was a, 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 a Marine vet uh, named Danny Aaron was killed. See, that is the kind of shit you see in Sons of Anarchy. Yeah. That, I mean, that that's, you know, I was saying sometimes Sons are, it's over the top. But in this case, I mean, this Sorry, was actually, 2021. This it was September, actually happened. September 12th, 2021, um, the government claims that, or the government claimed that, Nelson um, was responsible for the first degree murder of Danny Aaron. After uh, almost a year, the government dropped the charges against Aaron. Or sorry, dropped the charges against Nelson for the for the Aaron homicide. Um, and there had been a couple more people Why? that they were outlawed. Was, what, what? They, they, I have to go I, back through some of my reporting. That's all right. That's all right. I, I reported on it. It's on my website on Gangster Report. You yeah, can look fine. at it. Uh, I did. I did kind of a. Um, I remember you reporting an analysis that. of that case, and uh, it just it, you couldn't tell who had shot first. Right. Um, Nelson. They had him on videotape, and you could kind of see some of the stuff that the prosecutors were saying weren't true based on the surveillance video. 
Uh, I was told that some of these other guys that were charged, these other outlaws um, that were charged in the Danny Aaron homicide, uh, that, the, that, that the case is either about to be dropped or has been dropped against them too. I don't want to speak out of school. I know for a fact the case was dropped uh, about two months ago against Arlo Nelson, who was the, the number one defendant in the case. And this was another example of pagans and outlaws dust ups that end up in in dead bodies. And there's been a number of them these last couple of years. Well, and there's also Hell's Angels and Pagans that you know, have yeah. you ever seen that video footage on YouTube of in New York where the allegedly Hell's Angels guys whack a pagan uh member? Have you ever seen that in the Bronx? Yeah. So um you got like a it's on camera. Yeah, yeah, you can. You they can, got the actual. You hit. can see the surveillance. Yeah. So then the last one I'll talk about. Um, so they're fighting. There's like fighting on all sides. It's not just no. you know yeah. one against A against B. It's like A against B against C against A. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, so there was another incident. This took place in June of 2019 took place outside of a Longhorn Steakhouse uh, in Clarksville, um, which is Gotta love it. Uh, in Montgomery County. Uh, it's not anywhere near that? Nashville or Memphis or Chattanooga. It's kind of its own. Isn't some of that caught on surveillance video? Some of that footage all of this, made it. All of these were caught on surveillance yeah, video. Yeah, I was going to say. I, I mean, you can't do anything these days without your activity I being caught I think I've on seen some video. of that footage, too. So this was everybody's got a ring. The outlaws yeah. in Clarkston butting heads with members of what is called the Kin Kinfolk Motorcycle Group, which is a support club of the Pagans. So uh, the Pagans made some type of deal with Kinfolk, and uh, Kinfolk took issue with the outlaws because of this ongoing expansion by the pagans. Uh, they're looking to ba basically just uh, uh, steamroll over anyone that gets in their way uh, when they're coming into, to, into new towns, whether or not that group has been there for 40 years or not. And from my research, uh, the outlaws in Clarksville have been, um, uh, you know, very prominent there for a very long time. And the pagans didn't really, have any presence and they came in, they made a deal with this, this group, uh, the kinfolk. Um, and then, uh, let me back up for a second. I believe the kinfolk is now the pagans. I think in 2019, the kinfolk was what was called Patched a support over. club. But I think after this incident, I'm pretty sure, uh, kinfolk was then patched over to, to the pagans. So you had an incident at a steakhouse where the mayor of Clarksville was present when this happened. Oh, wow. Um, and it actually had a conversation with one of the uh, accused murders before the murder took place. What does that mean? And they're not, they're not saying that the mayor did anything wrong. It's just a coincidence. That the, uh, so the guy who got killed, or the two guys that got killed, was uh, the, the boss of the kinfolk motorcycle gang, a guy named John Allgood, who went by the nickname Deacon, and he was a long-time uh, presence in the biker world in, in Clarksville. Everybody knew him. And then there was a younger guy uh, named Jimbo Ramsey, who uh, was a victim. I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, dance on his grave at all, but his behavior seemed very, very unhinged. And you could probably argue that the, the people that killed him were, were, were again, acting either in self-defense or uh, trying to de-escalate a situation that was escalating because of Jimbo Ramsey. So you had a situation where you had uh, two members of the outlaws, uh, Mike the Hulk Craft and uh, Jackie Rapper Davis. A uh, Hulk and Rapper are indicted now for the first degree murder of Deacon Allgood and 
Jimbo Ramsey. They're going to go on trial some point either this year or early next year. And all this started one night in uh, June of, of 2019 when a prospect, a guy that was trying to become a member of the Outlaws, uh, saw a, a guy by the name of uh, uh, to Black, Zach to Black. They call him Toe Strap. So Toe Strap was driving to meet Mike Kraft and Jackie Rapper Davis at uh, a bar that wasn't Longhorn Steakhouse. It was called the Tilted Kilt. They've, they've got one around here. They're, it's a chain of of uh, Irish pubs around the around the country. And while he was driving to meet his superiors in the outlaws, he saw a uh, motorcycle or a group of motorcycles in the parking lot of the Longhorn Steakhouse, which he didn't recognize. So I guess if you're the outlaws and you consider Clarksville your territory and you see bikes that aren't outlaw bikes, I guess maybe your inclination would be to stop and see what's going on. Well, aren't you, isn't the protocol that if, if it's outlaws territory, if you're another patch club, don't you have to get permission to, well, the to, pagans, show, your, to show your, I guess, but the pagans and the kinfolk, uh, yeah. I guess weren't, weren't acknowledging well, that. That's part of recognizing that's, that. This is the conflict. Yeah. Right. So toe strap uh, enters the, Longhorn Steakhouse. I guess Toe Strap knew the mayor, had a conversation with the mayor uh, that lasted, I think, less than a minute, but he stopped at the mayor's table. Um, and then it depends on who, you, who you're asking. He either tapped Jimbo Ramsey on the shoulder as he was leaving, or if you believe prosecutors, made a grab for Jimbo Ramsey's uh, patch on his uh, vest that said uh, kinfolk. Either way, it led to a, a, a fight between um, Toe Strap and Jimbo Ramsey. Um, There's going to be a quiz, by the way. Yeah, I know, I, know this is, I know this is confusing. It's <laughs> With all these names. It's confusing for me, so I, I, I can imagine. <laughs> um, the, the, the first altercation is broke, is kind of broken up and then toe strap, the, the outlaws prospect goes to the tilted kilt where eventually he meets up with, with Mike Kraft, the Hulk and, uh, rapper Davis. And as they're leaving tilted kilt there, which is, I guess, adjacent to Longhorn Steakhouse. They are driving past Longhorn where they see uh, Deacon and Ramsey and they stopped. Now, whether they stopped to de-escalate or re-escalate is, is up for debate. But what is known is that at that point, Ramsey takes out a gun and starts waving it around the parking lot screaming at the top of his lungs, making threats. Deacon, who was his boss, is telling him to calm down, put your gun down. You're not going to do any good acting, acting this way. At, at some point, Deacon turns to toe strap and, and I think starts hollering at him, blaming him for getting Ramsey all jacked up to the point where he's waving his weapon around. And then Deacon Allgood, according to surveillance video and to, to, to the eyewitness accounts, headbutted toe strap, which then started other people shooting. And in that shootout, both, uh, Deacon Allgood and Jimbo Ramsey were were killed, and the the the, the kill shots came from Mike Kraft and and Rapper Davis. So let me ask you some conceptual things. Um, see what you think based on your reporting. And both, let me just point out that both Hulk Kraft and Rapper Davis were former like special forces. 
Like they had very extensive tactical gun training. Well, that actually is something I want to bring up and ask you about because it connects to the um, the first case in New England. The victim for the support club for the Hells Angels was uh, a fireman, fireman, firefighter. And one thing that uh, we've done an episode on, people can go back and check it out in the archives. It's actually right now our number two ranked episode is street gangs and outlaw bikers in the military in terms of audio episodes. It's our second most downloaded episode, but you can watch the video too. And uh, something that uh, we make in the case we make in that episode is that it's underreported the amount of um, former and current active duty military personnel who are, you know, patched over members of outlaw clubs. Um, but also, I think underreported is how many active police officers and firefighters are members yeah. of of motorcycle clubs. And again, to be fair. Not every motorcycle club is a one percenter, right? That I mean, for people if they don't, if they don't know that, that's fair to mention. So just because somebody is in a motorcycle club, that's the whole point of the one percent. That's the whole point of that designation. Is ninety nine percent of motorcycle clubs are just guys that are motorcycle enthusiasts who like to hang out. And they might be hell raisers, but they're not. You it's know, not, it's not a criminal. Conspiracy. It's not a, right, right. So the one percenters, it's a different, it's a different animal that that we're talking about. But in some cases, uh, the the cops and the firemen, it, it's not just the ninety nine percent. They're they're one percenters. Now that gets weird too because outlaw bikers, by definition, don't like cops. Yeah. So well, you, and you and get and this weird. And and when I we we did an episode, you know, with with another biker, former shot caller, and and. You know, talking off air that that this was sort of um, and he was outlaw uh, Pete, Big Pete. Yeah, he was outlaws, quote unquote, mothership. Yeah, which was the the clubhouse, the the chapter in Chicago that it all started, the South Side chapter in Chicago where it all started. Yeah, and no, it's still right. considered the mothership. But it's an interesting debate going on, which is like, um, is it kosher, if you will, to allow a cop? To become an outlaw because by definition you don't like cops. Yeah. But then the other side of it is, yeah, but it's useful to have <laughs> and it's not and have it's, friendly relationships with local police departments. It's not just happening in Tennessee. I, I I'm blanking on the club. It was either outlaws or pagans, but there is a case out of Hillsborough County um, by by Tampa St. Pete where there are I don't think just firemen, but like higher ups in the fire department at Hillsborough yeah. County that are being accused of being members of outlaw motorcycle gangs. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, I know this is in California too, not necessarily outlaw bikers, but street gangs. Um, and, uh, but from some of the, the people that I've talked to, you have this, a lot of it goes back to sons of anarchy, which we started the episode with that these cops fucking love that shit. And then they, lo a local PD, I'm not talking about FBI, ATF, DEA, things like that, but local cops, and then they, they they see a guy who's in like the outlaws, and the outlaws guy thinks oh, almost a cop is gonna fuck with me, and they're like oh no dude outlaws right on, <laughs> because they fucking they love that shit, and it's a uh, it's becoming a similar thing like the mystique of the Italian mafia, like like even sometimes people it's in law brand. enforcement get it's get the. Um, um, like the mystique, they get caught up in like, oh, I kind of like these guys, even though I'm not <laughs> I'm not supposed to. Well, it's a, it's a brand, and there's a sex appeal to the brand. There's right. a uh, there's something like you said, mystique. It's 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 very um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like uh, it draws you in. You're 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 almost transfixed by. By uh, the way that that the the blueprint is for some of these guys. I mean, I know the way I and, and talking about you know uh, the brand brand uh, recognition or brand loyalty or whatever. And again, no disrespect to some of the support clubs, but you know when I'm driving around and I see guys on bikes and I'm looking at what they're you know what what their rockers what their what their rockers are saying, what club they're representing, and it, if I see you know some club you know I don't recognize. Whatever, but if I see a guy wearing yeah. an outlaw patch, yeah, I'm like, okay, this this guy's the real deal. Yeah, I remember. Even though the the guy on the support club still might be a one percenter, still might be a badass, but sure. he's not with the big club. 
He's right. not in the major leagues. He's they, not. He's not hitting third in Yankee Stadium like some of the guys, uh, you know, are uh, in the Outlaws. And here in Detroit has been a you know outlaw hotbed uh, forever, and I've uh, been lucky to have some exposure to some of those guys. And they're the the real deal, man. Real deal, Holyfield, fringe of the fringe. I've been to some rock concerts where you see outdoor rock concerts where yeah. you see like for old old school rock bands, you'll see guys. Not just the outlaws, but other groups. But you know, yeah, but for it, for you know, Kid Rock is a is a born and bred Detroiter, and very proud of being from Detroit. And uh, you know, I know for most of Kid Rock's career, when he goes on tour, his security is provided by the outlaws. The outlaws are are very much a part of of, of Motown history. You know, the fabric of, of of at least in terms of the underworld and and kind of the dark belly of of uh, the Motor City, the Outlaws kind of weave their history through Taco Bowman, you know, besides Sonny Barger, who who was the famous boss of the Hells Angels, you know, Taco Bowman is without question, outside of Sonny Barger, the most notorious, well-known biker boss in American history. He and he's, Detroit and he's a, you know, he's the one who, who brought the, uh, at least brought the uh, presidency of the Outlaws to Detroit. And he led the, um, the outlaws uh, from the early '80s into the late '90s. Let me ask you Just one more. Died a couple years ago in prison. Let me ask you one more conceptual, uh, and maybe there's not an answer to this. These conflicts that they're getting into the one percenters. How much of it is tribal versus business, or is it that is that impossible to answer because it's both it's interwoven? Both. It's both, and I think there's something to be said about. There are, outside of New York City and Philadelphia, the feds aren't really making mob cases anymore. The feds are still making a lot of biker cases. I think a lot of the resources that were going towards Italian OC haven't just been shifted to terrorism. I think a lot of those resources have been shifted towards the bikers, um, especially uh in in these areas where we're seeing all of this disruption. Um, and one thing to mention about uh, Tommy O, who's the boss of the outlaws right now and in his regime and, and how he's kind of this chess match between him and, you know, the pagans boss, uh, well, former boss Conan, the barbarian who's in prison, but will be coming out soon. And I'm sure we'll be reclaiming his, his, his throne. And, uh, you know, it, this was all Conan the Barbarian's vision. This, this they call it the the blue wave, which is to you know spread pagan propaganda and and the pagan brand around the country to to become a national or international brand. And this is all his brainchild. So Tommy O had to, it's got you know like a making moves on a chessboard. You know, Tommy O's response was to beef up outlaws activity in New England, but just like the pagans are making alliances with the Latin Kings, you know, letting Hispanics join the ranks and, and, and get into powerful shot calling position, making an alliance with the Mongols. Well, based on my reporting, Tommy O's doing the same thing. He is reaffirming the outlaws connections with the Italian mafia, which have always been very strong, stronger than the hell's angels and stronger than the pagans. Um, the outlaws have always worked very close with the Italians and in, in every city that they're, that they're in. And just like the pagans were opening up the gates to doing business with non-whites, uh, Latinos and Hispanics, there might be some layers here, but I've heard there's some connections to some of the urban uh, street gangs, uh, gangster disciples, uh, and some other groups to fend off some of uh, some of this push by the pagans. I mean, I, I yeah, I know that at least I don't know about now, but I know at some point the Chicago outlaws they they had relationships with the black dudes, black yeah. gangs, Latino gangs, not just the the Italians. But what I mean by tribal versus business is I, I think it's interesting sociologically because some of the bikers people I've talked to, and I haven't talked to as many people as Scott has, but 
uh, they always tell me like they don't have a problem with like other clubs that it's it's about business and as long as business is fine and they're not encroaching on each other's business they don't give a fuck about these other clubs and I don't know if if, the, if they're telling me that because I, I don't know what their agenda is but that that's what they say and so that seems very different than like a street gang thing where it's like if you're the wrong set it doesn't have anything to do with business it's total tribal. Yeah. It's total tribal. If you're wearing the it's wrong the street, colors, in the street corner, you're gonna, right. This is street, our street corner. This, right, exactly. And the, and it's almost nothing to do with business, if anything to do at all with business. And I wonder with the bikers, um, how much of that? Because you do, it does seem a little bit tribal with this, like this is our this is our neighborhood, and you shouldn't be coming to our club wearing those other colors. But when you talk to some of the other well, guys, but, you think know, of, but think about it logistically. If you're the outlaws. And you've had control of, in, in in this case, or in these two cases that we've recently talked about, you've had control of Oklahoma City for 40 years, 50 years almost. You've had control of Clarksville for 30, 40 years. And there's been no presence of any other groups challenging your authority. And then all of a sudden in 2017, 18, Conan Barbarian from, uh, you know, his uh, bully pulpit in, in, Long Island, New York says, you know what? We're going into all those areas that we weren't in before. And then you go from having the run of the place in terms of at least that biker world for four decades. And then all of a sudden there's all these interlopers and carpet baggers. So I guess that, it, that, that does breed tribalism, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I wonder, like, um, it just seems like, um, you know, um, like if you can make money together, well, I guess it depends. Like if if you talk to some guys, they're gonna say, "Well, this has nothing to do with organized crime, anyhow. We're just we're just a biker club." <laughs> but if you if you if you if you acknowledge for the moment that some of them are involved in organized crime, um, it's not good for business to be shooting each other. Right. And, uh, <laughs> well, what's <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> well, that's there's there's you know the chickens have come home to roost. Yeah. This is what happens when someone declares. A war, or declares, you know, this 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 territory um, acquisition. Yeah, I mean, look what's happening. I mean, it's not the exact same thing, but you know, look what's happened in Europe. Uh, you know, Putin wanted Ukraine, so he grab. went and took it. Yeah, right. So right. you know, uh, right. Richter, Keith Richter, Conan the Barbarian. Like I said, this is I can't analogize. B besides. What Big Meech did with Black Mafia Family and what Lucky Luciano and Meyer Lansky did with La Cosa Nostra, I can't think of something as ambitious as what Keith Richter has sparked uh, from when he took over the, the, the Pagans in late 17. And this all started to kind of be um, implemented in, in 18. And... It's it's incredibly ballsy. It's you know it, it's it's as brash and as bold of a of a plan as you could conceive. And I don't think it's shocking that we've had bodies drop. And like you're saying, it, it undermines your your bottom line mm -hmm. because now you're in the headlines and you have resources and federal government being shifted and, and pointed at you. I don't, I don't know where it ends, but right now there's a lot of tension and and animosities brewing in the outlaw biker world around the country. And I think, I, I don't know the last time we were at the, the precipice that we're at right now in terms of pagans, outlaws, and, uh, uh, and hell's angels with how they're all going to coexist going forward. Yeah, well, it's going to be interesting. We'll continue to monitor it, and I know Scott's reporting on it. And, uh, and one uh, other, one, let me just point out one more thing. I was going to say here in De in Detroit, we we are we don't have a proper sample size because there are no Hell's Angels, so we don't see how Hell's Angels and Outlaws interact because Hell's Angels have never had a presence here in Michigan. That's a good. That's a really. That's a really interesting point, and. Uh, Luckily, we don't have we don't seem to have those tensions here. We don't want we, don't, we have enough violence here in the city. Uh, we don't need any more violence. But it seems to me like and you you know better than I would that this is an example. Like I'm talking about the coexisting. It seems here like 
the outlaws, the highwaymen, the vigilantes, they all seem to coexist. I'm not I'm not saying they love each other necessarily, but they seem to so coexistence seems possible, especially um Maybe it's because it's a bigger city and there's more of the pie. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, I, I wonder why. Because highwaymen have more members in Michigan than the outlaws. Yeah, it seems like. But the yeah. outlaws are more influential sure. nationally. Yeah. So yeah. I'm just going to wrap it up? Yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting. We hope to bring you more uh, topics like this. I know Scott will continue reporting on it. And um, hopefully we'll get some guests, too, that can uh, speak to this. You know, more guests that are actually part of that that world. So um, anyhow, thanks for listening. Please uh, again, follow us on social media. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. Scott Bernstein. Ben is in the house and uh, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.